Hi, Janik. Um, it's nice to have you here. Um, welcome, everyone, to our uh, first official podcast. And uh, it took us a lot of time trying to figure out who should be our first guest. And finally, I thought the most controversial person I should get on this podcast <laughs> is Janik. And um, the funny you. thing is, first time I met Janik, I thought he's a doctor. Um, I mean, he spoke all the medical language. And uh, later on, I figured out he was actually a CTO of a company. A um, few weeks after that, I figured out that he actually was in the army. Now I figured out that he's also a DJ, so it can't get better than that. Um, so yeah, thanks again for coming in. Um, why don't we start like who you are? <laughs> like, sure. who, who are you actually? Who am I actually? Um, so it's a philosophical question or a real question, but let me be real first. And then who am I? Yeah, we can answer that later, right? Um, my... So I was born in India, um, Bombay. Um, I spent uh, my childhood and most of my teenage years there. And I actually came to United States in my, uh, uh, right after my teenage years. So I've spent more than half my life in the U.S. Um, so I sound more Bostonian than, than, uh, uh, than an Indian right now. Um, but the formative years in India were actually very, very important for me um, for, for numerous reasons. Um, number one, I grew up in a third world country at the time. I mean, this was the seventies and eighties. And, um, when you see what you see in countries like India, you learn to appreciate what, uh, the world has to offer, especially in the developing or the developed world, which means that your appreciation for things like healthcare, things like safety, things like access to stuff, um, becomes very important and uh, very critical. So you are thankful for every time you have access to something because you knew and you still recognize that a large percent of the, of the world does not have that. So a big driver for me to leave India was to see how I can make what's available outside of India possible and bring it to India one day. Uh, bring it, and not just to India, but even countries like Africa. Um, because I always felt like, well, if they have it, why don't we have it? What's yeah. the problem? So that, that was, that was, uh, um, that's where I grew up. And, you know, I lived in the, uh, in an area called Breach Candy, uh, in Bombay. It was a bay. Um, now in Boston, I live in Back Bay. <laughs> so I've lived in two cities that are ocean, ocean facing, that have tremendous history, um, uh, specifically with the British. Um, starting with, uh, you know, Boston uh, and Bombay both. So it's now called Mumbai, by the way, but separate story. Well, what did you study? I believe you did some finance, like, yeah, a degree in um, finance. I did, I, yeah, my undergrad was actually um, in uh, finance and computer science both. Um, it was interesting because um, I had always wanted to be a physician, uh, always wanted to be a doctor, uh, and it's stereotypical where most people say like, well, you're Indian. Of course, your parents want you to be a doctor. In my case, it was different. My parents did not want me to be an engineer or a doctor. That's weird. Um, you have to be either an engineer or a doctor of to, course. to fulfill their Of course, positions. right? Yeah. But my parents essentially encouraged me to get into business and indicated saying, well, everything's great until you somebody has to write a check. <laughs> so you should be the person who figures out who should write a check and for how much. I mean, those were my father's exact words, to be honest. And, uh, you know, at, at the time I'm like, well, that sounds pretty good. And, uh, I, I guess you're right. But, um, given a choice, I would have actually become a physician, um, because patient care for me, it's like magical. It's like a superpower. Um, it is, it is one of the most fascinating fields that I kind of, uh, adore. Um, and, and the, re and the reason why it continues to be fascinating is because I started my healthcare career at Harvard University um, in early 2000. This was right after I had left the telecom industry. Um, and I, I entered Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And um, their uh, chief resident uh, was addressing um, uh, your uh, first year medical residents. Um, and I remember what he said is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's good news and bad news in medicine. And remember, this is like 2001, 2002 time frame, right? I mean, a long time ago, almost 20 years ago. It's like half of everything we know in medicine is wrong. And oh, by the way, that's the good news. Bad news is we don't know which half. 
And fast forward to 2019, and we're talking about radiomics, we're talking about genetic medicine, mRNA-based treatment patterns, et cetera. And that statement is still true, right? We still don't know which half is good and which half is bad. Um, and I think being a part of that in some capacity, even when I did finance and then I did my computer science, uh, was very important for me. So I guess, you know, the, fate has a very strange way to kind of uh, make you live your dream. Either you're on this side of the table or the other side of the table. So I feel in my little world, I'm still helping patients and, bring, and bringing therapies globally. So, so how, how, how do you do that? Um, I understand you started your career in Harvard. Uh, let's talk about this. Like, yeah. What do you do today? Um, how are you? I know that you're um, actually doing some, um, some work at the, you know, at the school there, at the, at the medical school. We there. Are. You're actually yeah. rounding with students. Um, <laughs> Yeah. How? How? <laughs> like, I want to know how can a software engineer end up doing grounds in the trauma department? Yeah, that's the plan. Um, so, you know, it, it, taking a step back of what I do right now cal- kind of will answer a question saying, why did I decide to join some of my friends at a teaching hospital and round in um, a profession like trauma? Um, so uh, Currently, I'm the head of strategy and the chief technology officer of a company called Life Image. Um, Life Image has been around for over 10 years. Um, it's actually one of the world's largest medical imaging uh, exchange company and digital transformation company, uh, servicing hospitals, small community centers, medical device companies, pharma companies, etc. cetera. Um, the company manages approximately about 1,900 to 2,000 hospitals and about 100 million patients annually. So it's, it's a large footprint, um, and it, it serves a very fundamental and a core problem of digitizing and democratizing the information that should have been shared with the patient and starting with medical images. Um, Life Image was actually first to market 10, 11 years ago. Um, so it's a, it, it's a network company first, in a technology company second. Um, and it allows the patients and the physicians to share information anywhere in the world, actually. It's not just limited to US. Now, what I find is uh, building a network and kind of uh, following the patient and what's important to the patient is impossible for me as a technologist and as a person who's leading the world's networks uh, if I don't understand what the patient's actually feeling. Um, you know, in the military, we used to call it, you, you really need to see a firefight to feel it if you want to be a general. You cannot be a general unless you be in a firefight. And my definition of, I mean, using that analogy in healthcare, I, I, I really feel that unless I live it, it's impossible for me to sit here in front of you, look you straight in the eye and say, well, this is what the patient needs. Um, because if you were a patient and you, if you had that condition, you would just look at me and say, you have no idea. How do you even know? Right. Yeah. So I think it's important for me to do that. Um, my reason for choosing trauma surgery and, and rounding in trauma surgery is because that's one field in medicine where I still believe, and I'm, gl- I'm, I'm like, uh, look at trauma surgeons as like Superman because you have no idea who the patient is. You have no medical history. You have absolutely no clue what the patient is allergic to, whether or not if you administer penicillin, how the patient's going to react, et cetera. But yet your job is to keep the person alive. How do you do that with no known medical history on the patient, right? Um, so it's a fascinating field uh, in, in, in various different ways. Uh, number one and number two, uh, the, the adrenaline behind the time to treatment uh, is very important for somebody like me to kind of live it. Um, because you only have n number of seconds or minutes, you know, uh, and how do you treat a patient in a, such a short period of time? Um, from an art perspective, uh, it's fascinating for me. And my take is that if systems and products and experiences work in that environment, then it will work in any environment. Um, so that's my, that, that, that's a long-winded way of saying that. I think it's important for us to understand the patient's journey and the patient experience before we become technologists first. Um, there, you know, I mean, in, in, in my journey in healthcare, I shouldn't say this, but you said I'm the controversial, but I see a lot of product managers, uh, Boston, New York, Silicon Valley, especially here in the Bay Area, who say that they're 
digital transformation change agents and product managers of healthcare IT companies haven't spent a day in the hospital, haven't spent a day in a payer or an insurance company, haven't spent a day in patient care environments. So it really irks me when people say that they're leading products and they're going to change and disrupt the industry when they have no idea what happens as a front desk. And that's where I started at Harvard, right? I mean, I didn't start as a C-level executive or like with a fancy title. Um, I started as a project manager in mental health and primary care and in after hours urgent care. I started in uh, general internal medicine and I was observing how the workflows work and what's important for the patient inside a hospital. And I spent almost a decade doing that in Boston. So yeah, I, I went through the firefight. It was painful, it was awful. It was very difficult for me to watch what the patients went through, but it gave me a perspective to say, yeah, this is not important for the patient. I think there are more important things, high value things we can build. That's actually a, a very interesting point because um, I agree with you. We hear all the time, this company is going to disrupt healthcare. Um, then you look at the executive team, how many hours did they spend with patients? Close to zero. Um, but what did you learn? Like, what did you learn spending time with patients? Uh, what are your main, like, main learnings coming out of, uh, <sighs> of hours and hours, basically rounding and even spending time with management and, and administration in, in those big hospitals? Um, I still feel that I know very little about healthcare, and not from an administration perspective, but more from a treatment perspective. And here's the reason why. I mean, as physicians, you guys are taught to be independent thinkers, to be scientists, um, to have unique opinions. And in fact, that is encouraged because it's, it, it's important to have um, differential opinions as physicians. If all the physicians had the same opinion and the same way to treat a patient, that would, it's considered uh, a problem in medicine. But w w when, you, when you transcribe that philosophy and that mentality of how to treat patients in, uh, in a real world setting, and fast forward to 2019, where AI and machine learning is the mantra, uh, one of the key aspects and challenges we find is nobody knows what the variability in care is uh, because of how medicine is practiced. So I can either look at the glass half full or glass half empty. I'll look at the glass half full saying, yes, we don't know variability, but also uh, we have amongst, we, we treat really complex patients with some of the best known outcomes across these complex conditions. So if you were a patient who's sick in Dubai or Vietnam or India or even Shanghai and Beijing, you would come to Mass General Hospital, you would come to Stanford, you'd come to MD Anderson. You're not gonna go fly to another country. I mean, those are the hospitals that's at the top of your mind, right? So yes, we have variability in this country, and yes, we have issues in terms of tracking variability and assessing what you know how the patient outcomes are managed and tracked across hospital systems, et cetera. But yet, the world considers United States to be the the final destination for the best treatment from the best doctors on this planet. And I think I truly believe that we can make it better uh, going forward. So. Um when, when you joined Life Image, um, so Life Image is a company that basically transacts images uh, or DICOM data from site A to site B. And in the past, I remember you, you used to get CDs, right? Like a patient would come to you with a big CD. Uh, now we don't even have computers that have those like CD thing anymore. Um, but Life Image makes that pretty much embedded into the EMR. Um, can, can, can we talk more about that? Also, I, my understanding is that you guys are expanding now outside the DICOM world to be able to transact more than just that and get even to the doctor notes and all of this. So what's going on with Life Image? What are, your, what are you guys doing today? What are your plans? So before I answer that question, at least a personal experience that happened to me six months ago, and I know some people who know about the story are, are going to hate me for this, but uh, so I practice martial arts professionally, and in one of the fights, I dislocated my left shoulder. So they did a shoulder x-ray. Um, I won't name the hospital, but it's a large academic medical center in Boston. Is it a life image customer? It's a life image customer. <laughs> okay. uh, and I... Uh, and I asked the front desk saying, great, thank you. Uh, when can I expect my shoulder x-ray? Because I'm going to see a sports medicine doctor. And the response was, well, you got to come back, fill out a form, and pick up your CD. 
Um, which was very confusing to me because A, that was a live image customer. So clearly there was a, some training issue going on over there. But uh, more importantly, the the lack of apathy or empathy with which a healthcare professional that's patient facing talked to me um, was very disturbing because now it's that experience is personal, right? Um, and yes, she made me fill out a form and I, and I asked her saying, well, you know, um, I assume that as a part of that, I'm also going to get my physician's notes. I'm also going to get my lab results. But I got the CD and I told her saying, I don't know where to put it. I don't even have a CD player. And my sports medicine doctor may or may not have a CD player. And if he does, he may not be able to read the CD because they're different systems. Um, and her response was, well, that's our policy. And if you have a problem with it, I'm sorry, but that's all you get. So that's the first problem with healthcare is where's the apathy and where's, you know, for the patient. Um, and yes, we have laws in place. Um, and the latest regulation from the ONC states that, you know, you have to democratize health information. You have to give it to the patient in the way the patient can read it and in a, the medium the patient demands, right? Um, but reality is different. You know that's not going to happen in a community hospital in Topeka, Kansas. It's yeah. just not going to happen, right? When you, when you talk to the teams there, though, um, their point is like, look, we signed up to help patients. We want to be have all the empathy to patients. But if you ask me to sit in front of an EMR system, entering data for like six hours out of my eight-hour shift and fill in forms for another hour, you cannot expect me to have like all this kind of energy to sit down and explain things. And there is a point there, right? There's True. a point where technology actually became... Uh, between the patient and the caregiver. Um, and I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's bad for the patients, but you also have to look at, at it from the other side, right? Um, I, I feel bad, like I, I, talking about centers in Kansas, right? Like these are guys are operating yeah. in, sometimes in the middle of nowhere, doing their absolute best, but they still have to meet minimum requirements of data entry and, and um, like I believe one I was talking to this oncologist and he said, Hey, I have 15 minutes with a patient. I spent eight minutes entering data in the EMR and mm. the rest is left for the patient. Um, so, so, so I'll make another controversial statement. I hear you. Um, but it's not up to the physician to decide what to share with the patient and when to share with the patient, if the information is about the patient. So whether it's my test results or my genetic counselor notes or my pathology report, et cetera, I should get it. So if you think about the concept of the best experience is no experience, which means that nobody should press buttons. I shouldn't even have to go to medical records. The fact that medical records as a department exists in 2019 is just strange. So what, what are you suggesting? Like When you see a doctor you should have access to everything the doctor has access to behind the scenes. Period. End of story. You're a patient. It's your data. Why do I need to request my own information? Why do I need to fill up forms? So again, the best experience is no experience. So I'm not saying the technology can solve everything, but there is no other industry that I can think of where I have to go request forms for information that I own or it's about me. Yeah. You're actually, you're actually right. If I mean, if you go to the bank... After you finish your session with the serve, customer service team, they give you a bunch of papers. That, Here's Correct. a summary of everything that happened today. Uh, but you don't get that with doctors. Hey, part of it is also like um, legal, right? Doctors don't want to of also course. give you everything because some people will just take this and make claims right and left. Of course. But that's where the industry is going. That's where I think. And, and to answer your question earlier, saying, well, what is Life Image doing and what's the plan? That's where, from a strategy perspective, uh, we're leading the industry um, focusing on medical imaging data. And imaging can be categorized as radiology, cardiology, pathology, um, pictures of uh, people's skin, face, everything that has an image or a media associated with it, right? And we are seeing an increasing number of uh, different uh, medical data types actually being exchanged across our network. Um, it's lab results, it's discharge med lists, it's flow sheet items, it's problem lists, it's everything. It's all of the above. So it's not just DICOM data. It's not just DICOM data because people figured that, well, if the patient's being transferred to another facility, uh, it should be as simple as texting where I press a button, I aggregate all the patient information where, about that episode and it should just reach and it should be just uh, uh, show up in the medical record system or the PAC system. 
So people are leveraging the network in very different ways that was originally 10 years ago, not intended, but now it's become second nature to say, well, the patient's being transferred to trauma at a different center. So all the notes and all the interpretation results and all the discharge meds should be attached with it and just it just shows up. So there is there are no CDs or there there is no paper trail behind it. I mean, that's the holy grail. And we're seeing an increasing number of things uh, of workflows along those lines, which is a good thing. So you guys are like a cell phone company uh, that basically let EMR systems talk to each other Correct. in a big way, right? I would say EMRs, LIS systems, PAC systems, all of the above. That's yeah. the, the, that's pretty neat. And um, I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't even know that this kind of technology do exist. I mean, you hear all the time about interoperability problems and um, what we should do. People don't understand that there is already existing technologies and existing networks that can actually do those kind of transactions. Correct. How, how, how good is the adoption rate? I mean, how, do, you, do you see actually facilities sharing data between each others or like, um, do you see like, what kind of adoption? Is it more towards academia or do you also see community yeah. hospitals doing that? I think I see the community hospitals being a lot more open for sharing this information. Um, on the academic medical center space, um, there is still a large percentage of them um, that even if you bring the right technology, uh, they will not share all the information. And I can sit here um, telling you with a straight face. And the reason for that is because our incentives in the U.S. healthcare system are not aligned. If people use referral revenue, the, the hospitals will go out of business. So it's not the hospital's fault. They're trying to protect their own revenue. So stop calling hospitals and hospital administrators data blockers. They're not data blockers. Fix the compensation system. Fix how the, uh, the physicians and the incentives are aligned to essentially compensate for value instead of saying, well, you know, I'm going to get paid per episode in certain areas. I mean, we don't even have a good definition of value yet. Yes, there are certain areas that are beginning to get mature. But if you ask any physician, any chief across um, any specialty saying, well, how do you define outcomes and value and good outcomes associated with value? Um, you'll get a very different answer. So why, why, in your, why do you think community hospitals are more open to share? I mean, first off, I agree with you. Um, I, see, I see that community hospitals are actually leading the technological Correct. revolution in healthcare. Um, it's not the academic centers. Um, I, I, was, I would actually categorize academic centers as more of blockers rather than enablers. Um, but why? why? Why do you think so? Um, I, have, I have my reasons for it. I think community centers are a lot more aligned with patient care in terms of um, making sure that the patient gets what they need and get to where they need uh, without uh, creating additional barriers to it. The community hospitals, generally speaking, uh, are not actually trying to protect their uh, patients. They're actually trying to make sure that the patient is getting uh, the best care and the right access to care within the time frame possible. So if a patient gets referred to uh, a large hospital system or a large academic medical center, um, you will see, you're absolutely right in that we're seeing the adoption and the speed of adoption, not just for imaging, but for any data set uh, within the community space being a lot more uh, open and a lot faster compared to an AMC. Yeah. Um, you know, in a, uh, talking about cycle times, I mean, generally we see... Uh, an academic medical center or large integrated delivery network um, implement get into an implementation life cycle with life image anywhere between um, three to four months, sometimes six months across the entire enterprise, which means the software implementation can take hours days. you know it's a pretty sophisticated piece of technology to enable networks. It's like bringing a cell phone on a network and you're up and running. But to convince all the chiefs across the entire hospital saying, hey, you know, you should deploy this in cardiology, you should deploy this in OR, you should deploy it in the inpatient, et cetera. I mean, that is a marathon. I mean, that's a marathon. The, the, the IT teams in, in big hospitals are very fragmented. In many cases, um, someone who's working in cardiology doesn't necessarily understand all the software solutions that the room next door, uh, which is doing radiology, has also adopted. It, it, is that a correct assumption? It is a 100% correct assumption. And, uh, and to be fair, this is not just in US, but we see this globally. Um, we see this in Germany, we see this in Ireland, we see this in France, we see this even in Middle East. 
Um, and again, administratively, the way hospitals were run were each department has a chief and had their own budgets. And each one of these budgets essentially rolled up into a P&L from a reporting perspective, but decisions were made independently by each one of the chiefs. Yeah. So the IT fragmentation is a virtue of how this, how each one of these departments were incentivized for reimbursement, which dictated their budgets. Which blocks any new disruptive Correct. technology to be able to make Correct. a disruption, for say. Correct. Um, in community hospitals, it's not the case, right? You go there, there's only one guy who's running everything from setting up printers to setting up this new EMR system. He knows it all. Like he knows it like from from A to Z and he's the sole decision maker. If he says, yes, everybody is going to be blessing your, your software adoption. Yeah. Um, but you see, one of the problems is, and I really like this point, like the healthcare system is built in a way where it actually blocks any technology innovation to be uh, adopted in, on large scale. Um, but the interesting thing for me is like, unless you have those big logos of big academic centers on your company's website, the community centers are not going to feel comfortable working with you. So it's like a chicken and egg problem, right? It like is. you need to get those big guys uh, to get the smaller guys. It the is. smaller guys are not going to come to these. Like, how did you guys work? Like, how big is your network, by the way? Like, So uh, currently the Life Image Network is a little north of about 1,900 hospitals and clinics and tertiary care centers. How um, long did you guys take um, to build this? It, the, the initial tranche of, I would say, 80%, it took us almost a decade to build it. Um, 80 to 85 percent of all academic medical centers actually are on the Life Image Network today, um, and those who are not are connected, uh, you know, um, independently through our cloud infrastructure. So technically, we cover 100 percent because you don't have to be on the Life Image Network to share data amongst each other. You can create uh, temporary accounts. You can create accounts directly with patients in real time, etc. Now. I would say that, how did we do this? You're absolutely right saying, well, how do you penetrate a market? My, my take on that is, um, if every AI company and if every healthcare tech company tries to create its own network, um, it'll be eternity till I wait for- It's, a, it's another decade it's for another, everyone. Exactly. It's another 10, maybe even 20 years to do yeah. that. And what we are observing in the market today, so when I talk to hospital CIOs or pharma CIOs, um, we're, we're observing that they're asking their primary vendors, such, such as Life Image, uh, to become the curators and the distributors of AI technology inside their hospital systems. So, I mean, if you think about a scenario where you're talking to a hospital uh, CIO or the head of strategy, he or she is not going to sign 50, 100 different independent contracts with different vendors on different stacks with different upgrade schedules and different support mechanisms. Um, that's an absolute nightmare. So the distribution, the governance, and the uh, and the management of bringing novel innovation and novel technologies inside hospital systems needs some form of a uh, framework to distribute and manage. And putting that operating burden on the hospital CIOs is not the way. I think the industry, HIT industry in general here and in Europe, uh, uh, we're under this misnomer saying, well, I got funded for you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollars as an AI company, and I'm just going to go ahead and sell it. Well, no, I can assure you that's not the case. Um, I have not yet to meet a single AI company that can, that has told me saying, well, I'm going to build my own network and I'm going to build my own network and I'm going to do it within the next six months, a year, two years. Uh, many have tried, but eventually what lands up happening is that our customers um, don't want to take that burden and they keep on redirecting these companies back to life image saying, well, Life Image is al already the uh, industrial IoT of medical equipment uh, in uh, at scale across the United States. So why don't you just work with them and they can distribute? The challenge here is going to be always data rights, right? Um, if I use Life Image as a distribution network, who owns the data and who owns the data rights? Um, especially in AI, um, you have all the derivative work rights. Like if my algorithm becomes smarter using your data, does that mean you own IP with me? Um, so there's usually those like challenging situations where how can you figure out data rights? Um, who owns what, right? Um, who owns, and also who owns, again, the derivative work in an AI world where actually the data itself doesn't mean as much, but the algorithms built on those data is worth millions and billions of dollars in many cases. Um, IP becomes a big problem. 
It, it does indeed. I mean, we live and breathe this stuff, right? I mean, Life Image is the distribution network for um, some of the top uh, and well-funded AI companies, both at Silicon Valley and in Boston As area. As a disclaimer, Mendel is uh, one Mendel of these is companies. Mendel is one of our partners, <laughs> yes, right? So um, there is no perfect silver bullet pixie dust answer to that. Uh, it, it's all negotiable. But one thing is clear about who owns the data, the patient owns the data. Uh, the patient has the right to consent, the patient can revoke the consent, and the patient has essentially the right to ask their providers who they're working with as far as data rights are concerned. So let's get that very clear. There is no vendor that owns patient data today. It, the patient owns it ultimately. Um, now, having said that, uh, if I give a piece of anonymized patient data to a vendor and the vendor uh, increases the value for that data because now you have better insights or some biomarker that you found uh, associated with uh, a, a, uh, a condition, should I get access to that biomarker? And should I get access to that data that's now more enhanced uh, compared to what I originally gave you? Um, it really depends on how your contracts are structured both with the clinics, the hospitals, uh, and how your consents are formed with the patient, and how well you're able to negotiate with the vendor. Yep. Because it's protectable IP, and as you accurately identified, saying, well, now it's your, your own data is enhanced, but it's my data, I used it, so if you want to reuse it, you have to pay me money. Um, don't, it, it's, uh, we're seeing a variety of different business models around it. Some will actually share that with you, and most will say, well, let's negotiate and let's figure out as a, as a fit for purpose use case of how we want to structure those contracts. Yeah, yeah. but you, you, don't you feel like I mean, yeah, patients own data. That's very theoretical, to be honest with you, because in reality, yeah, don't you feel like hospitals, community centers, academia, they feel like they do own this data? Absolutely, and as I would say, especially academic medical centers, right? I mean, a lot of AMCs I worked with uh, over the last decade and a half feel that, that their data is the best data. Um, I don't want to name names, but you and I both know who those institutions are. And people who are in the business of networks, we just sit back and smile saying, okay, so you're, the patients you see and the outcomes that you have and the kind of problems you have are just unique amongst all five or 6,000 hospitals in the US. Like you're the only hospital that has this. How is that possible, right? And what I have found, because we work with pharma companies in the real world evidence space, we, I, you know, we've worked with drug development pipelines in oncology and cardiology, and we consistently hear uh, time and again, and this is not just for U.S. hospitals, that we need access to heterogeneous data sets to fuel um, drug development and partner with hospitals across the country uh, rather than work with a single institution and work with the homogeneous population. So because every hospital system feels that their data is special and, and that their data is more valuable than the neighbor next door, uh, they tend to be very protective about it. And if you want access to it, you have to negotiate, and those negotiations could last 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. Yeah, but you're not even negotiating with you're the patients. You're not even negotiating. You're negotiating with the Correct. hospital, right? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you ask, if, uh, I mean, a very good example is 23andMe. 23andMe yep. went to their customers and said, hey, uh, we would like to open your genetic data for researchers. And they found very interesting stats. A lot of their customers were willing to opt yep. in and share their genomic data for the better good of everyone else. And I'm pretty sure if you ask any cancer patient, hey, can I share your data with this drug developer or with this AI, this AI yep. company is building this really big next algorithm that can predict prognosis or something, they're all gonna say yes. Um, Yet the hospital has ownership on the data and the hospital doesn't feel like, why should I share this data with you? Um, and, I, and I have seen like in many cases, they were like in almost most of the cases, they don't want to share data, but in some cases yeah. they are willing to, but they are concerned with all the leg like regulatory compliance stuff, right? Like I don't want to share data with you and find my hospital in the headlines of every big like in the news next day, right? Because now I'm sharing patients' data, you guys got hacked or whatever, and who's gonna protect this data? Um, what's your take on that? I feel like de-identification of data has been a big problem. Um, it, as if today we can de-identify very basic information. We can de-identify first name, last name, social security, um, 
from structured databases. But when it comes to clinical knowledge that's strapped into PDFs, uh, that's strapped into faxes, that's strapped into doctor notes, there is not yet something that exists that can de-identify this data, make it in a very uh, safe way to be transferred from one site to the other. Yeah, you, you're correct in that uh, the the sharing of data is one problem, but even if you share shared that data, the discoverability of the data that that has enough commercial value um, by virtue of demonstrating clinical utility uh, is not up to par when you talk about novel data assets such as unstructured notes, medical images, uh, voice files, etc. I mean, how do you DID a voice file, right? Yet, uh, vocal biomarkers are emerging as one of the key indicators of uh, certain uh, 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 certain drug development pipelines. Right. I, I also um, heard you one time say at a two can be an identifiable data in a DICOM file. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Now, I would say that there, the technology to de-identify information and to give enough confidence levels, both for the patient and the providers, saying that yes, we can use this for research. Uh, is only beginning to emerge. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, Mendel is working on some pretty innovative and very novel uh, de-identification process for unstructured data sets. I mean, unstructured data sets are notoriously complex. I mean, how do you distinguish between a physician name and a patient name inside a note, right? How do you know what the context is or when to de-ID it? I know you guys are figuring it out, so that that's really exciting work. Um, some of the other NLP technologies uh, used for DIDing uh, or identifying patients to DID that we've seen in the past is not up to par yet. Um, we are working with a very big partner here in Silicon Valley uh, to, uh, to DID uh, medical images, essentially removing the names of patients, social security numbers, date of births, et cetera, any identifiable information inside an image. Because we believe that the, the scale of heterogeneous data sets that we can make available for uh, training AI algorithms um, demands that we ha we can scale in uh, this data across different AI companies. Yep. Because majority of these AI companies are currently trained on publicly available data sets that are three years, five years, 10 years old. Yeah. And one of the biggest- Which is actually biasing a lot exactly. of the algorithms. It is uh, biasing. It's not, it's not in, in touch with the real life. Um, it is. A lot of these yeah. data are actually built on data sets that are available online. Um, and yeah, when we started the company, we we figured out from day one, like if we build anything on top of this data, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so would it be safe to say like, we need two major changes here. One is behavioral. We need the CIOs of these hospitals to understand like, look, you guys are housing this data, but you don't own the data. It's the patient's data. And we need to unlock this data to fully uncover what we don't know. Like you started off this podcast saying, in medicine, we don't know what we don't know. And Correct. the only way to figure this out, if, if every hospital opens up their data sets for researchers and for AI companies to be able to dig into this data and identify these problems. Yeah. But I also think coupled with this behavioral change, we need technology, like we need technology that is able to de-identify different formats of data, makes it safe to share it from one side to the other or from one researcher to the Correct. other without uncovering. Um, I was having this talk with, um, uh, he's he, he's one of the top um, doctors at the county of Los Angeles. And he was saying, look, um, we get to see movie stars. I'm not going to put my data with you where you can get to know this actor, what they're like, yeah. if they have any medical condition. And I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to expose their data to you. Um, and I hear him, right? Like, you don't want to do that. But if you can show that there is a piece of technology that can de-identify this data, make it safe... Um, one very interesting story that I got to hear from 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 my co-founder, he was uh, he did this experiment and he got humans to de-identify data, mm -hmm. and he figured that the best performance had accuracy of ninety six percent. So you had four percent error rate. So if you give them hundred files with hundred pieces of identifiable data, they will de-identify ninety six, and there's still forty four percent error rate. Um, we built an AI system that performs at ninety nine point seven percent which actually performs way better than a human being, right? Makes, mm -hmm. makes you way safer. But even still, people don't trust it. They want to trust a human being sitting down and redacting data with a, with, a, with, a, with a black marker. And how can you get that? It's again, comes back to the behavioral change. You need CIOs to be more open to explore these technologies and, and understand how it works. I mean, uh, I, I personally think the way I have kind of uh, led some of these uh, educational conversations with hospital CIOs um, 
is there is a tectonic shift in the healthcare industry in the United States and in Europe, and even in some parts of Southeast Asia like Japan and Singapore and Vietnam, but where you you have to, as a hospital CIO, respect the convergence of multiple stakeholders in healthcare coming together for the benefit of the patient, right? Which means that a pair and a pharma company and a med device company and a, a, a PBM and a care delivery network such as a hospital or an IDN uh, cannot operate in a silo. But today, they're operating in a silo. But that convergence is, is real. It's happening. I mean, we saw last year when uh, Roche bought Flatiron Health. Well, Flatiron Health is a medical record company servicing oncology centers. And Roche is a drug development company, right? Um, those kind of transactions are beginning to emerge as uh, standard rather than novel. Yeah. We also know Roche bought Foundation Medicine. Finally, they completed their acquisition. Well, Foundation Medicine the, uh, is a genetic testing company, right? So now Roche has the capability to very accurately... Um, Marry uh, like the genomic correct. and the clinical data. Uh, correct. And that is what precision medicine is all about. If the hospital says, well, I'm not going to share my information with the payer, and if the payer says, well, I'm not going to share my information with the, with the hospitals, and, uh, and the pharma company says, well, I'm not going to share my trial information with the hospitals, I mean, it becomes a, a, it becomes a joke. And precision medicine or, um, you know, uh, essentially just becomes a theoretical word. Um, so I think it's very important for uh, all the stakeholders to recognize that everybody is in business to service and serve the patient. But, uh, uh, and I'll tell you that, Janik, like um, one of the very popular uh, EMR systems for community cancer centers that shall rename unnamed, um, they basically tell you, um, like they are cloud-based systems, yep. right? And <clears throat> um, say the hospital, the center decided one day they want to get um, a download of a patient data uh, or a patient came in and said, I, need, I, I want access to all my data. They will give you parts of your data but other parts are not to be given, like PDFs, scanned documents, doctor notes. They say in the fine print that those data are not to be shareable. And this is for me like, wow, what do you mean? I mean, this is his data, not your data. Um, and those are like, I'm talking about big companies that have a lot of sites and a lot of, a lot of cancer centers are using them. And then when you go ask them, um, hey, um, Patient X wants us to get access to all his data. They say, "Sorry, we don't. We cannot give you access to that. Um, it's housed in the cloud. Our systems are not built to be able to download this data. Hey, we can still give you all his claims data. We can also give you all his social security names, like things that are clinically irrelevant to me, right? Um, what do you think about that? I mean, what kind of a world is this? Like, uh, <laughs> like I, I, I and, and you're a technology guy. What kind of a cloud-based system that cannot allow you to download data that's already housed there? So uh, you know, let's call a spade a spade. It's not. This is not a technology issue. Uh, this is a risk management liability issue. Um, this is a kind of convoluted interpretation of law um, to tell a patient saying, "Well, you can't have access to your own data sets." Right. So. Can I create a 200-page PDF file and hand it to the patient? Absolutely. Of course you can do that. Um, can you burn a CD? Of course you can do that. So my take is that these are, these are liability-related uh, issues, um, especially in an economy where we are here in the U.S. It's a very so happy culture compared to Europe. Um, and the safeguards that European Union has with regards to protecting patient data, we don't have the same framework. And I'm not saying that we just have to uh, uh, utilize the uh, European framework in the United States. I mean, each one of them has their pros and cons. What I'm indicating is um, I think the private companies have too much power and too much rights today to access and manage it. For example, I'll be controversial again and say uh, Epic is one of the biggest EMR companies, um, private companies that manage a big portion of the U.S. population. Um, should they be allowed to house that much private information? And should Epic be told that they should democratize any and all information to the patient? Or are they too big to fail, right? I mean, using that analogy from 10 years ago. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it really worries me when a single private healthcare IT company 
manages hundreds of millions of patients that we can't access today, right? The other thing I would also say, you talked about clinical utility. <clears throat> um, ask any researcher and they will tell you today that medical claims data and even to a greater part structured data coming from the EHR is not that useful. At all, actually. At all. Non-small cell lung cancer, e e there's no code for that. Correct. It's coded as lung cancer. Right? Correct. Uh, it, it, I, it, I believe that at least 80% of what you need from a clinical perspective it's is in trapped notes. in the note or, or, or in a scanned document. It's in the notes. I mean, I, you know, one of the examples that I gave uh, um, a, set, a, a bunch of physicians I was talking to is uh, physicians essentially um, giving a diagnosis to a patient that does not have the diagnosis only to get the procedure approved because, uh, because of the way the incentives and the reimbursement structure in the United States works. So a physician thinks about the best outcome for the patient. And the physician will decide saying, well, I don't want to put the patient uh, on a medication regimen. I will just go ahead and do the MRI because I know exactly what the problem is. Well, the insurance company won't cover for the MRI until you prescribe the medication. I mean, that's just how it works. Yeah. So if you look at the claims data, you will feel like, well, you know, let me look at all the patients who are on a certain drug profile. Uh, and you will incorrectly characterize that, co that patient and identify that patient with a cohort, um, which is medically irrelevant. I, I think this is a great point. Uh, but a lot of people in healthcare don't understand that. Correct. However, if you read the notes, it'll say that, yeah, the patient, 45-year-old Caucasian male, went for a hike and sprained his back. Yeah. And... There is no code for sprained his back. I mean, this is a classic example in pharma, right? I mean, one of the biggest problems that they've had is why do people switch drugs or why do you prescribe a certain drug at certain staging uh, in, in oncology during the progression um, of, of, the, uh, of the tumor, right? And the example of, the, of when a patient stops taking a medication is actually not that hard in many cases. Because if you're 70 years old or 80 years old, and if you understand anything about drug toxicity causing adverse events and overall quality of life, you know the answer to that. The 80-year-old will say, I don't want to take the med because it makes me feel like crap. <laughs> well, there you have your answer, yeah. right? So the medication suddenly is stopped. Yes, you have prescribed it, but there is no adherence behind it because it, it's not giving a good experience. But there is no code behind patient experience. Yeah. But guess where it is? It's in the note. Patient declined to consume med because patient was feeling poor. It's just you're having right. snapshots of a story, but you're not having the full Correct. story of the patient. Uh, that actually brings me to a very uh, to, to another big topic, which is like you know AI is, is the big buzzy word now in in technology, but in healthcare it's real world evidence, it's real world data. Yeah, um, and you find there's like a lot of companies now, almost every company in data analytics, in healthcare data, it's claiming either that they are the pioneers in real world evidence or the pioneers of real world data. Um, you start <clears throat> digging into what they're offering and all what they have access to is claims data. Do you actually think claims data can be categorized as real world data and real world evidence? Um, it's a tricky question because from an epidemiologist perspective, it depends what you're studying. If you're studying cost structures like uh, burden of care, burden of illness, et cetera, you do need claims data, depending on the country that you're in. If you're studying high-level kind of incidence prevalence rates, in some cases you do need where the highest incidence rates of certain uh, conditions occur or at least are identified or screened. But if you're trying to understand um, therapeutic area effectiveness, uh, comparative effectiveness, um, if you're trying to understand disease progression, if you're trying to understand uh, prescription patterns, if you're trying to understand patient behavior, then claims data is the last piece of data you should use, number one. And number two, I would indicate saying majority of the questions associated with real world evidence are retrospective and are a point in time asset, which I think is a fundamental flaw in real world evidence. Real world evidence by definition is that it's a living evidence network that you can get access to as the patient is being treated, which means it's a network. It should be called a evidence network at the end of the day, right? Um, because a, a, a real world evidence and all the data sets that define that evidence is not a point in time asset. It's a continuously shifting, continuously changing and redefining your condition. 
the patient qualifies for a trial today, he or she may not qualify for a trial tomorrow. Next week, yeah, that's true. And but how do you know? How do you know that if you don't touch that data for three months, six months, a year, right? You're incorrectly again ca uh, characterizing a patient that shouldn't belong to the trial. I want to I want to come back to this point because I think it's another big myth. Like a lot of people don't understand what you just talked about right now, the difference between retrospective and live networks. But before I before I go there, um, can you explain in plain English what is the difference between structured and unstructured data? Because I go talk to, um, I can part of my job is I talk to a lot of uh, PIs, I talk to a lot of research coordinators, I even talk to a lot of pharma executives, and you'll be surprised. A lot of people don't really understand what is structured and what is unstructured data. What's the difference? Uh, and if I have an EMR system, how how much of my EMR system is structured and how much is unstructured? Um, so can, can, can you talk about sure. that? Um, I'm fairly clear about my definitions. I often get challenged, um, but I have yet to find somebody who can prove me wrong 100% of the time. So let's see how good I do. Um, so the definition of structured data is things that are well-defined uh, and discrete values that are fairly consistent within a system or a vendor, which means that uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 is diabetes mellitus type 2. Um, it's not DM2, it's not DM type 2, it's not DM Roman numerals 2, etc. It's diabetes mellitus type 2. That's a structured data element, um, and you can count it which means how many times does diabetes mellitus type 2 occur within my health system, right? Uh, the other example of a structured data set is gender, is age, um, is a MRN uh, within a hospital, a medical record number, um, et cetera. And unstructured data would be a clinical note, would be a voice file. Uh, it could be a interpretation coming out from a genetic counselor, et cetera. So anything that's human generated, anything that has high variability in terms of context, correlation, and causation amongst all the different uh, collection of clinical uh, variables is unstructured data. So I could dictate something and give you a dot .wave file that's unstructured data. All the best trying to anonymize it, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and the other pieces of structured data is actually images. Genetics and images are structured data sets, which means that the pixel and the way the pixelation for a mammogram occurs is a very structured and discrete data element that's very unique to you as a patient. Interesting. So if, so if you get a chest X-ray, that chest X-ray is you. That's how but you're defined. But the note coming with this X-ray, the radiology report the coming with is unstructured part of it. Correct. And if you're trying to identify a biomarker, it is a misnomer that just because you have access to just the image itself, that you can accurately identify the biomarker. You need the node with it. You need to be able to So Rishi Y is like, how, like, is it two to one? Is it four to one? Like how much is structured versus unstructured and then given? I, I would say that uh, I, I don't know the ratio, but I, I want to put a number, a numeric value in it, but I would say it's 80-20. Uh, which means 80% of the data is actually unstructured yeah. that nobody has access to. I, I definitely agree with this assessment, 80 to 20. Yeah. Which also means any, any vendor or any research that's talking about, uh, we base this on claims data, you basically base it on 20% of the story. Which is biased. 80, which is super biased. So there is 80% of the story that you have no idea Correct. about. And um, um, great, I mean, the challenge that comes with those unstructured data um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, I mean, free, like doctor notes and, uh, and even radiology reports, those are actually clean unstructured data. What we find is 66% of the unstructured data today, especially in oncology, is, are actually scanned documents. Those are faxes. Or uh, those are the patient coming in with a big binder full of records, asking course. the nurse to give it to the doctor. The nurse scans that, uploads it. I mean, I make this joke all the time. I feel EMR records are like a Dropbox. Um, it's mainly a place to drop and scan documents into it. Um, do, do you agree? Do you see that also like within your network? Do you see a big portion of it to be scanned documents? We absolutely do. Um, <clears throat> um, in fact, we we joke around at Life Image saying that the uh, the most disruptive piece of technology in our network is a scanner. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> because the amount of uh, scanned documents and images that we have to digitize is just staggering. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a statistic. Um, so we manage between 10 to 12 million clinical encounters a month. Uh, that translates into about eight or nine million patients uh, managed monthly at Life Image. Eighty to eighty-five percent of those clinical encounters are coming from scans and CDs. Yeah, this is current uh, present-day uh, statistic, twenty nineteen, which means that the industry, however um, accessible they ha uh, the the the, uh, the administration has to the technologies. They're still not using it. And it's not the hospital's fault. It's, it, what happens if a patient walks in with a CD or, or, with, uh, or with a set of binders? What are you going to do? You don't have a choice but to accept that binder. In, in oncology, one of the most <laughs> important pieces of data is your biomarker. And that's usually a report that was faxed to you by Foundation Medicine or by Keras or by any of these big companies. And usually the patient takes that, goes to the doctor, and the doctor asks if that can be scanned. Um, I agree with you. You know, the, the, one of the problems that we have seen is um, there are systems like OCR systems, like character recognition systems that are able to convert those scanned documents to, to, to like text. Um, what we have seen is that most of these technologies are built on top of English and medicine is not actually English. Hepatosplenomegaly. You Correct. don't find that in Merriam-Webster. Uh, so those systems actually fail and we are at a point now where we need innovation. We need systems that are able to understand medically, medical scanned documents, not just the scanned documents. Um, you'd be surprised. We talked to a lot of CIOs and they, they think of it as an Acrobat Adobe Reader, right? Like they have this conversion tool on, on, on PDFs and they think like I'll convert it into, into, a, into a digital format. But the error rate and sometimes is up to 70% error rate. Yep, um, 100% agree. My favorite topic and a huge uh, topic of even personal interest uh, from a technology perspective. And here's, here's my assessment of where, you know, the current state of uh, transcribing a, a concept extraction uh, from unstructured data and mapping it to a ontology, a clinical ontology that you can actually make sense out of. Um, there are pieces of technology offered by very large companies today that claim that their NLP is married to a clinical ontology. But you and I both understand that they have significant gaps in terms of how they can extract the context in which they can extract and whether or not they are able to establish the right correlations when you're trying to write the algorithm, right? Um, I mean, Lucene, most of these companies are built correct, on top of Lucene. Correct, right? I mean, answering a simple question saying, well, what is the strength of association between, you know, splenic lack and lower left, left uh, rib fracture? I mean, nobody can even assess that if you analyze notes. Uh, yet it's one of uh, the three biggest variables for uh, uh, blood pressure medications in trauma surgery. I um, mean, patients coming in, patients bleeding out, you're pumping the patient with uh, blood pressure meds. Uh, but nobody's looking that, at the fact that the patient has a laceration in the spleen because he broke the lower left rib. Uh, that's a classic example of a strength of association. I mean, there's a 26% correlation between that. Um, but Jenny, if, if uh, hypothetically speaking, if you are the CIO of one of these big hospitals or even one of those community centers, and you have tons of vendors knocking your door, each one of them is heavily funded startup or a very well-established big player like IBM Watson, for example. And you have all these vendors knocking your door and making really bold claims. Hey, I'll OCR or you scan documents. I'll build real-world evidence on top of your data. I'll figure out all your inefficiencies, all of this kind of claims. Honestly, how would you vet those vendors? I mean, as a CIO, you're not an AI expert. And at the same time, a soft, you cannot be a master of all these kind of technologies that people are coming knocking your doors with. Um, and we have seen like there's millions of dollars spent in marketing and for you to be able to vet the claims, how would you do it? Uh, what, what's your advice for all those CIOs out there? Yeah, I mean, my, my recommendation, uh, I face the same challenge and it's not that I have the perfect answer because those same vendors are even coming to me and saying, hey, can you distribute my AI algorithm and can you do this, right? So I'm in the same boat. My challenge personally is exponential because now I have to think about 1,956 hospitals, <laughs> not one hospital. Um, and how do you do that, right? Uh, the way, so I'll give my personal example and we can take, use analogies of that to see how the industry wants to react to it. Um, the way we look at parameters is the maturity of the model, the data on which the model is trained, 
the heterogeneity of the application, which means that if you have an AI algorithm for chest X-ray triage, does it only work on the GE machine, or can it also work on Philips and Siemens and Hologic and Agfa and Fuji and Koenig and Minolta, et cetera, right? I mean, those are very important uh, questions to ask. Um, in terms of the marketing claims behind a lot of these companies, um, most of these wouldn't stand a chance um, if you brought in large-scale real-world evidence data sets to validate their models on. Um, I don't think the answer is, well, we need more regulation and we need more uh, kind of forced carrot versus stick, in this case a stick model, to say that you have to train on a certain cohort of patients coming from n number of manufacturers. I think that's a really complex to govern and fair and very expensive, and ultimately those expenses will be passed on to the consumer. So that's not a fair, but there has to be some balance um, that is indicative that you can't just train a model on 50 patients and declare a victory and apply for an FDA approval. That's just not how it works. So I think there there needs to be a set of governance and a third-party validation. I agree on third-party that's, validation. That, that's, that's network-based. That represents uh, a, broad, uh, a broad set kind of uh, vendor data type and patient characteristics uh, to make sure that your algorithm actually works. Um, because God forbid, I mean, one of my favorite questions is that if there are algorithms doing chest X-ray triage, who owns the liability? If there is a misdiagnosis, who owns the liability? If there is a not just a misdiagnosis, but a, a inability to identify incidentalomas, so you 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 get a pen scan, um, you know, an eye to thigh scan, um, and uh, you have an incidentaloma that is. Uh, uh, fairly serious, and it's malignant, it's associated with oncology, but the algorithm misses it. Uh, and the patient comes back really sick six months later or a year later. Whose responsibility is it? Had a human seen it, would that human radiologist found the incidental finding? Um, those are some fundamental questions in medicine that we really need to answer, because that has a direct um, relevance to how well these technologies are going to be adopted, uh, what the utilization of those technologies are, and and frankly, what is the trust factor behind them? So I would say the recommendation is um, the maturity of the model, the applicability of where it was used, how it was used, um, what are some of the uh, initial peer-reviewed research uh, um, indicative of how well that model works, important questions to ask. I, I agree 100%. You know, um, we have seen companies uh, that made really bold claims into the trial matching industry. And um, we, you know, at Mendel, we, we decided to publish. We wanted to take our claims to the test. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to get four trials and get humans to recruit for it, then apply AI and see how the AI performed versus the human. And then uh, when we submitted for peer review, um, there was no previous literature. Like there was no prior literature mm -hmm. that the peer reviewers can refer to, that can reference. And it was pretty interesting. There is hundreds of companies out there and zero publications, nothing. Nothing was peer reviewed. None of these technologies were peer reviewed. And I, I feel it's the responsibility of both investors and CEOs of companies to start putting um, some kind of a benchmark before starting a go-to-market strategy. It's not like you can't put a minimally viable product. Um, I mean, it's not Snapchat, right? It's not a basic software that you can yep. build and go out there in the market and test uh, product market fit. You have to spend a year or two building your technology, validating it, and your investors has to be willing to put money and invest in you, knowing that there is not going to be revenue anytime soon before I can validate my model, before I can make sure that, if God forbid, if my mother is sick, I will trust this algorithm exactly. on her, right? Exactly. Um, and I think this is a good litmus test for every CEO and for every investor. Would you trust, if you're one of your loved ones have cancer, would you trust this algorithm or not? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and one of my favorite examples in that is, you know, yes, there is a data issue or a data problem in healthcare where it's not that we are generating a lot of information, that we don't know how to coalesce this information, access that information, and correlate that information between and amongst each other. That's the issue. Because if you think about, you know, comparing healthcare to any other industry, I personally think that is, that is unfair. And I personally think that's, uh, that's actually irrelevant. And if you're making that analogy that, well, we figured this out in fintech or we figured this out yeah. in e-commerce. It's irrelevant. And here's the reason why. There are two very concrete examples, right? Reason number one is when you make an ATM transaction, um, you generate about 36 or 38 data points. I forget how many exactly uh, from an ATM. 
When you see a physician for a 15-minute visit or even an 8-minute visit, you're generating over 1,000 data points, each one of them critical to how you li live your life, whether you live or die, right? So there is no comparison in terms of scale. The other example in healthcare is um, when you share information as a network or even uh, EMR to EMR, uh, the data is uploaded and consumed once within five minutes or eight minutes. So when I interview an architect from Netflix, I did that a few months ago, he's like, well, we figured this out at Netflix, right? Um, and I'm like, no, you did not, because it's upload once, consume many, and your data life cycle is forever. And you have the patience to wait if the circle of death continues if you don't have Wi-Fi. Well, what happens if you cannot access your MRI while you're sitting cut open on the OR? And oh, by the way, my life cycle for that data is only a few minutes, so I need it instantly. Yeah. Um, so I think... And, and the last example I gave uh, was uh, to an executive at Fidelity. Uh, he mentioned saying, well, you know, you should just use blockchain for everything in healthcare. I'm like, great idea. But do you know? Because, you know, if your 401k is at Fidelity Investments, but if your checking account is with Bank of America and you have another 403b account with Harvard Vanguard, does Fidelity know that you have a Harvard Vanguard account? No, they don't. But guess what happens in healthcare if you don't know and if you cannot connect the dots? So no, fintech has not solved it. You cannot link your 403b account with your 401k account and say, well, we figured it out and uh, it's up to the consumer. Well, in healthcare, you have to figure it out. You can't say that, well, I completely missed seeing the head CT scan, but I'm going to treat the patient for a tumor. Which brings us to the point he raised at the very beginning of the interview is you need to see patients. You need to spend some time in the hospital before you sit down and say, I'm a CTO or I'm a CEO of a health tech company. And Correct. Um, it's very few of people have done that. Um, Janik, uh, what people don't know is your wife is also in, is in healthcare. And we wanted to invite her for this interview because I heard that you guys have the most heated dinners. You don't never agree on real world evidence or real world data concepts. Um, so she wasn't able to make it today, but can we talk about that? Like you come from a very health techy uh, family. Yeah, indeed do. I mean, she's at the forefront of healthcare delivery. Um, and as a physician, um, she is the one that's on the front lines, dealing with front desks, dealing with insurance companies, dealing with uh, patients, um, and dealing with home, home care aides, et cetera. Um, and often... Um, not for the good or bad, but as a physician, uh, it's very important uh, for her to kind of keep me in check as a technologist. <laughs> and here's the reason why. Uh, as a technologist, your answer to everything, and you probably got the pattern in my response saying, well, I can solve it in five different ways. Um, but there is something to, uh, to the effect of uh, uh, the physician's engagement capacity with the patient, the humanistic approach to it, right? Um, there are a lot of theories and a lot of articles written recently about make AI human again uh, or make data real again, um, right? Uh, the reality behind that is it's very difficult to replicate physician behavior, not patient behavior, during a care setting. Very difficult. Because if you think about the, I mean, you, you, if you remember going back to, to med school yourself, Kareem, like how many decisions did you have to make as a physician before you prescribed the med? right? It's not two, three, four, right? Your if-then statement, your end or clause is 50, 100 levels deep before you can make those recommendations. So I think those conversations- One of which is, can the patient even afford it? Correct. Right? Like, should Correct. I prescribe something where Correct. the patient goes out there and he cannot afford it? Correct. Other big question would be like, uh, sometimes the patient's religious views Correct. would go against something that Correct. he would do. Um, and even in some cases, you should I even tell him- Right. What kind of diagnosis he has, or should I wait and talk to his family first? Correct. Right. There's a lot of uh, correct emotional intelligence correct. that is needed to be able to be to, to practice medicine. I think EQ is number one skill, and I, I personally don't think it's just for physicians. I think in any profession, if you don't have EQ, if you don't have tact, um, it's very difficult to operate nowadays, especially in in the healthcare profession. My co-founder doesn't believe so. He believes that <laughs> AI is going to replace humans. Well, and he said he trusts a machine more than he do trust a human. So, so you don't think AI can replace a doctor, right? Uh, I I don't think it's going to replace a doctor. I think it's going to augment and mature uh, the behavior associated with the physician, um, which means that 
are we trying to make physicians better at how they treat patients? Absolutely. Um, I don't think the word replacement uh, is in the AI dictionary yet. Uh, even in radiology, even in radiology, right? Um, you know, to give another example <clears throat> around AI and behavior is um, you cannot replicate. I mean, we did this analysis in my previous job. In order f to replace a eight-minute follow-up visit for a primary care physician, uh, you need over 1,100 AI algorithms, each operating in a heterogeneous en 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 environment. And oh, by the way, off those 1,100 algorithms, uh, the industry globally has barely touched 10% of those. <laughs> so you cannot even touch an eight-minute follow-up visit with a primary care doc. So no, you're not going to replace uh, the doctor. Yet. Those are very interesting stats. I didn't know that before. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you look at all the AI companies in Israel, everybody in Europe, uh, specifically in UK and Germany, and everybody in Canada and US, we've barely scratched the surface, which means that you ain't seen nothing yet, Karim. Uh, you are going to see a, an exponential growth in the amount of investments going uh, in, in medical AI technologies. Very few of them will sustain. But where the rubber meets the road is, how do they all come together? And are they, are they all going to be able to work together? Uh, with each other. Janik, you also did some VC, like you, you, you're, a, you're in the VC industry for, for quite a while. Yep. Um, so yeah, we add this. I, I really want to see a copy of your resume. I mean, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's a very complex resume to go through it. Uh, but you, you, you did some, some investments and as you, as you just said, there's still a huge opportunity for AI yeah. in healthcare. <clears throat> there's a lot of investments that are still needed. How would you vet those investments? Yeah, I mean, um, and, 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 and how would you also like build a financial model as a VC firm around a company that comes in with a very challenging problem, needs a lot of training data, needs a lot of time to be build, to, to able to build and validate algorithms on those training data. Um, how, how, how would you build a, a lucrative financial model around that? I mean, one of the common things that we see uh, here, especially in the Silicon Valley is people want to see traction, right? Yep. Unless I see traction, how can I trust that I can make an investment in your company? But well, I'm an AI company. For you to see traction, I need to build models. And to build models, I need to hire AI engineers. Those are super expensive now. So I need tons of money to do this. And you will see traction, hopefully. Um, but there's this risky phase in every AI company that needs some kind of a leap of faith, right? You just need to trust the team. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't have a good question. Should you trust the team? Should it be about their prior work? Should it be about the potential of, 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 or the kind of market they are approaching? Like, how would you tackle that? The, the, the way I have, uh, I, if I put on my VC hat, <clears throat> um, any AI company is generating a piece of evidence. And evidence is only relevant and good as long as it's able to connect with the next piece of evidence. And evidence, especially in medicine, as a silo is meaningless. To say the patient will react, react adversely to a certain medication therapy is meaningless unless you know about the patient characteristic, which means you need to marry that evidence with the patient characteristics, age, gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera. And your ability to marry with the next piece of data and to train a model that can look at all the edge cases is dependent on your ability to access, govern, and manage at a network scale, which means an, the business of AI is directly relevant and directly dependent on the networks and the distribution channels that you have access to. As an AI company, you're not gonna replicate a network that took 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to build. You're not gonna build the next Optum. You're not gonna build the next IQV. It's not happening. But then the challenge becomes is like, how can you get Optum to work with you, right? It's even harder. Like it's sometimes in many cases, it would be even a harder problem than going after the, the sites. Well, the, how, how are you gonna get Life Image to work with the, you? Right? The question is, do I wanna work with Optum? Mm -hmm. And here's the reason why, because <clears throat> um, we, we discussed at length about the value of uh, medical claims data and EHR data, but I will say that there are data broker companies out there um, that are commoditizing the ability to link to other data sets. Yes, you still need companies like Optum and like Athena Health and like IQVIA and like Truven, et cetera, to curate all the, the claims data. So there is value in those data sets, but there is greater value and specifically clinical value in other data sets, which means that I may not need to connect directly with Optum. I may partner with somebody like DataVant, like Health Verity. Um, and by the way, we've already 
linked the life image data set with medical claim, 228 million patient claims data sets and EHR records. So I can already do that, right? Um, which means that I don't need to do business with these large broker models. I can approach my questions uh, with a fit for purpose uh, model where I can ask very specific questions saying, well, you know, what is the, uh, um, what is the family history of a patient who has had a certain condition and who's smoking X number of packs a day? That's coming from five different vendors. It may include life image data. It may include claims data. It may include purchasing behaviors of how many packs of uh, cigarettes the person smoking, et cetera, right? So I don't think the relevancy is around how we work with Optum. I think the relevancy uh, or the right question is around how are we going to be able to marry different pieces of data, most of the structured data assets slowly being considered commodity technology going forward. So we're seeing big players like like Google, Amazon, um, even the co-founder of Groupon. Like we're seeing like tech giants coming into the space and saying, "Look, um, you guys need us in healthcare. You don't know what you're doing. Let us basically show you the roadmap on how to do it better." Um, what's your take on that? Do you think these guys are going to be able to make a dent? Uh, I mean, Amazon launched their Amazon Comprehend, right? Yep. We've seen IBM doing the IBM Watson. Uh, we, we're seeing now, as I said, uh, the co-founder of Groupon starting Tempest, millions and millions of dollars of investment. Um, successful story, a couple of guys from Google starting Flatiron. Um, do you see, like, w one question is why? Why are we seeing those big companies coming to healthcare, which is, it's, it's, it's not an easy industry, uh, a lot of liability, a lot of regulations, and what kind of impact should we expect from them? Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, one of my biggest partners is one of the world's largest tech companies, uh, not naming names, but, uh, uh, it's a pleasure working with them. Um, not because they have it all figured out, but because they haven't all have it all figured out. And here's the reason why, um, I think the kind of talent, the kind of skill and the kind of, uh, personalities that healthcare IT historically have a, has attracted are people who were ex-hospital administrators or, or people who grew up in a hospital system, myself included, by the way. I grew up, my healthcare career was in a hospital system uh, in Boston. Um, so I have very set, structured ways of thinking about solving problems because I have been molded that way. It has only been in the last four, maybe five years that there has been more influx of people who have no experience in healthcare suddenly showing up in healthcare. Yes, you should be patient facing, you should have at least some understanding about patient care and delivery networks and incentives and reimbursement and uh, quality metrics, et cetera. But having said that, uh, solving a fundamental issue of DIDing and anonymizing medical images, that technology actually did not come from a healthcare IT company, that, that's gonna come from a tech company with life image. But that is f the number one most important pieces of technology that's going to shift and change how we think about training AI models and imaging, right? Um, I personally think that Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, subsidiaries, other subsidiaries of Alphabet, um, Oracle, uh, Intel, except all these big tech giants um, are going to uh, not create a monolithic giant medical record system company, but they're going to find and are already finding and funding different ways of accessing information, solving very fundamental issues within healthcare workflows, administrative workflows, et cetera. So we shouldn't ignore them as it's a fad. It's not a fad. And if you are one of those crews who is kind of discrediting the tech companies in Silicon Valley and Cambridge, Massachusetts as being a fad, you are the one who's out of the door because you are going to be replaced very fast. Um, and, you know, as uh, being, in the, being in the venture space and being in the startup space, I constantly see business plans being pitched uh, to these tech companies, companies raising money. And I can tell you the collective roadmap that's in my head, and, and it's kind of like being able to see what the next 10 years are going to look like. Um, there is going to be significant disruption, and most of this disruption is going to be in the medical record system space. Do I still believe that Epic and Cerner are going to be around 10 years from now? Absolutely. Nobody is going to deinstall Epic and Cerner. It's just, they're way too complex, way too big. But 
it, but are there going to be parts that Cerner controls, that Epic controls, that Allscript controls that are going to be chipped away and put in the hands of either consumers or physicians or more sophisticated AI companies? Or they're just going to be completely automated? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I also believe that uh, if you think about the statistic, the collective market capital for uh, EHR companies in the United States, I think it's about nine or 10 billion if I get my facts right. Um, collective market capital of all EHR companies in the United States is about $10 billion. What do you think the market cap for a single drug for a single company in one therapeutic area is? It's over $100 billion, right? So you can't ignore the innovation going on in pharma. You can't ignore pharma driving and fueling a lot of this convergence. Pharma, I, I, I think you know, pharma is sick. It's like pharma is done with all those EMR vendors. Correct. They feel like they are stopping Correct. their pipelines. Correct. In an, in an era where precision medicine is everything, they Correct. need access to data Correct. to be able to build their pipelines. And those vendors are between them and, and, and the access to data. And I'm pretty sure that pharma companies are going to have to do something about that. Absolutely. Those. And they already are. I mean, I gave the example of Roche and Flatiron earlier. That's just the tip of the iceberg in the kind of pipelines that are going to be fueled in the MA cycle. Um, I would also say that let's not ignore the whole B2C space uh, in healthcare IT. I mean, we've talked about enterprises and hospitals and pharma, um, but there are many innovative companies in, there are direct-to-consumer companies um, in Silicon Valley, in the Boston area, that are doing some very innovative and amazing work. Um, you know, Patient Ping is one of my favorite companies. Citizen here, uh, Citizen with two eyes. Uh, in, in Redwood City, one of my favorite companies in, in this space. I think people should pay attention to them. I think they deserve a lot more respect than flack that they've been getting in the industry uh, because they are trying to attempt some of the most difficult problems of uh, democratizing and allowing the governance of patient data to come directly from the patient. Um, those models, as, as business models, have been attempted in the past with the uh, I mean, everybody remembers Microsoft Health Google Vault, Health. Google Micro Health, Microsoft et cetera, Vault, Google right? Health, yeah. Um, but I don't think the timing was right. I don't think their ecosystem had the right partners. And I think, th I don't think the market was ready 10, 15 years ago. But the market's ready now, it's prime now. It is, but I would argue that in some therapeutic areas, it's not. Uh, oncology is one. I'm telling you, some EMR vendors wouldn't let the patient get access to his own records. Now, if you build a B2C company in oncology, you're going to get very fragmented records. You're not going to get a full history right. of the patient. And that's a big problem. But if, if we go in other areas like diabetes, cardiology, I think there is a huge progress yeah. happening there. And I, and I agree with you, the ecosystem is, is there. And I, and I think this is another big problem. Um, healthcare is a very generic word. Like when you say healthcare, yeah, healthcare, what does, what does it mean? Exactly. Is it... Are you talking about what kind of therapeutic area? Yeah. Uh, are you talking about drug development? Are you talking about technology? Like there's so many different things. And I feel like every therapeutic area is a different animal on its own. It uh, is. We needs different algorithms. So one of the things uh, that I read on, like uh, we are in the AI space, right? And we see a lot of companies, uh, we get this question a lot from pharma companies. Uh, can you guys do things outside oncology? And obviously for right. any pharma client, they want to have a one-stop shop, right? Like they want to have one platform that allows them to be able to power all their pipelines. Yeah. Um, the problem is in AI, and you know that, like the state of AI today cannot support a very generic AI. Um, Correct. And take, for example, oncology. Patients are tagged as a stage one cancer patient, but in one of the records, we can see that the patient became metastatic. Now, can your algorithm understand that? And if you build, spent time building that, can you translate this to another therapeutic? Can you have same resources to do this on all therapeutic areas? I, I highly doubt so. So I, I think one of the, the, the challenges is we need to dissect healthcare into therapeutic areas when it comes to AI. Try to tackle one therapeutic area at a time or even divide companies to tackle those different things. And maybe through mergers and acquisitions, we can come in together or <clears throat> in... Five years from now, the state of AI is different and we are able to build more generic models that can be translated into different therapeutic areas. But at the moment, I just don't feel confident, even like being a CEO of a company that I would come and say, even if I have a check on the table and I say, hey, my tech will work. I mean, I know it does, it, it works, but I'm 100% positive it's not working as good as in oncology or as good as in this area that I'm focused on. Yep. I, do, I, do you guys see that like also in radiology? We, we absolutely do. I don't 
I don't think there is a piece of technology that's able to uh, assess or identify certain biomarkers uh, for lung that uh, could even work in the cardiology space. It just does not work. And what we've also found is uh, the translatability of these AI models, even amongst vendors, does not work, which means that a piece of technology would work in GE, but would not work for, uh, on a chest X-ray coming out of Siemens. Again, biased data Correct. training, like trained on data coming Correct. from one single device. Which means that we, sh we should not be pointing a finger at Siemens and GE saying that they have variability in the quality and the output of the image. No, they don't. It's highly regulated. But we should at least point a finger at the AI company saying, well, who did you work with and who are your partners and how much information have you accessed for this one therapeutic area? Right. Uh, we also find in imaging, uh, which is a very, very complex space, that the the technology, even if it works across manufacturers, the pathways and in, in the configuration in which the study was captured influences how your AI algorithm behaves. Which means, how much contrast are you going to give uh, during a study? When was there, when was that contrast administered? What was the manufacturer for that contrast? Was was the uh, uh, was the contrast ratios adjusted based on the patient's uh, race, ethnicity, um, BMI, et cetera? Or did the tech really screw up uh, during the study? A lot of those variables are not considered when we say that the AI algorithm works. Now, yes, you can, you can manipulate via software to identify or kind of increase the accuracy, the specificity, sensitivity associated with the model. But at the end of the day, I think we have a long road to kind of... Uh, address the heterogeneity or the uh, replicability of the AI model, even within a single therapeutic area. So let's get one thing right um, exactly. before we go ahead and say that, well, you know, uh, I am XYZ company and my model works on any kind of uh, a, an imaging biomarker. Um, it's not true today and it probably won't be true even next year. But what I'm challenging the industry is we should get there because if we don't, it impacts us personally. I mean, healthcare, everybody's a healthcare consumer. Um, this is not this is not about buying shoes or buying cars. It impacts everybody at some point in the career. It impacts me, right? Um, and I would also say that if you're in healthcare, everybody should take the Hippocrates oath. It's not just for physicians. Everybody touching healthcare impacts patient safety. Uh, that's a great point. That's Period. actually a really great point. Uh, I mean, at at any given encounter with the patient, the doctor is using several softwares now. They're using several hardware, they're using several devices, several softwares. And each one of these guys are actually responsible for the outcomes that this patient is gonna get at the end of the day. I mean, if I'm, a, if I'm an EMAR vendor that I'm trapping all the patient records, they wanna share it with someone else, I'm actually responsible for those patients not getting the best outcomes because we cannot compare to other patients. Correct. If I'm a doc, if I'm if I'm if I'm uh, an AI company that is saying I'm going to help you identify whatever stroke or 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 some adverse effect, I'll I'll help you identify that and predict it. And my algorithms fail. I'm responsible for that. Correct. And people need yeah, that's actually a great idea. Maybe they have to make this as a regulation or something. People need to take an oath. Like you're not going to make a claim unless this claim is solid enough. Unless this claim, you know that there is a patient life here on the line. Correct. Um, when I again, and I love this, the theme of this interview is like unless you sit down with patients and 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 actually see a clinical setting, you, you don't understand healthcare. And um, I remember when we started the company, um, our engineers, like they are engineers, they went to computer science schools, they, 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 they're not doctors, right? So I took them to um, one of our, like one of our main customers is in Bakersfield. And Bakersfield is, it's not a small town, but it's a, a town that not a lot of people would like mm -hmm. to go there because it's not like, there's nothing attractive there. And there is a cancer center and we work with them and they came in and they saw this patient. She was on a chemotherapy, like she had this, uh, yep. uh, like, uh, <clears throat> tubes and all of that. Mm -hmm. And she was smoking a cigarette. So she was walking out in the parking lot, smoking a cigarette with one hand. Um, I remember that the guy was like, wow, what is that? How can she do this? Right. Um, they came in the center in the reception area, waiting for, for the CEO to come and, and, and meet us. They saw people crying. Mm. They saw people laughing because they just got to know that they're all cancer-free now and people crying because they just got to know that they are diagnosed by cancer. 
And only then they started to understand how serious what they are doing is. It's what they are doing is the fine line, again, between life and death. Um, but anyways, later on, as I said, we did the study and we figured out that AI was able to find 50% more patients than human beings. What mm. that means is there was 50%, there was tens of patients that came to that site and had a clinical trial that they would match to, a life-saving clinical trial that they would match to, but they were not identified, right? Now we're talking about patients who probably passed away and there was a life-saving option right next to where they were mm -hmm. living and they never got the luxury to, to, to at least try that, right? In many cases, patients are not expecting, are not just expecting to live more. They're only, all what they need is to be given all the possible options that do exist. That's Correct. what they want, right? Um, and for a company to come and say, I'll give you all the options and they don't, it's actually, a, it's criminal. It, it, it's a very bad, I like the oath idea. I think we should do this here in Mendel, actually. <laughs> we should get everyone to go through the oath. Um, one of the best like um, speeches for Steve Jobs was uh, when he talked about connecting the dots, right? He thought like Correct. he studied, I don't know, uh, cryptography, then he'd studied like different things and then he connected the dots and built Apple. Um, I have to ask you this. DJ went to the army, CTO of a company. Now I got to know that you do martial arts, uh, live in Boston, but he was raised in India. Now when you connect all those dots together, what is it? What is it that you can share with us? Uh, <clears throat> there, there is a reason behind uh, everything I've done. Um, if you're asking me philosophically if to connect the dots, um, I've chased a firefight all my life, which means uh, um, I've gone and done things and worked in companies and worked on technologies uh, where generally people would shy away. They're, they have all been high risk, high intensity, and um, kind of uh, uh, things that people only could conceptualize or theorize. Uh, theorize. It has never been actually done. I mean, uh, before Life Image, my previous venture was Generation Health. I mean, we were in the pharmacogenomic space 10 years ago. Pharmacogenomics was still a research word. We actually commercialized it, and we sold the company to CVS. Um, it was one of the most fascinating times in my life, right? Um, so I think people with my personality and my background, uh, we look for a firefight because we take, in, take it on ourselves that if we don't do it, time is going to run out and we're going to be in trouble. And I personally feel that in healthcare, time has run out. This is urgent. Um, We've created a mess of a system that the next generation will have to fix and face. So for me, I feel like I'm getting old, time's running out, and somebody needs to do something about it, right? Um, and eventually time will run out. I will get old, you will get old, and we'll be out of the system. And I don't wanna be one of those people who kind of regretted not being able to fix issues in spite of having known them. Um, so for me, it becomes a personal responsibility, and that's why I'm still in healthcare um, that's one of the reasons I uh, left the venture capital space and got an operating role um, because I personally felt like I think I'll have to do it to fix it because nobody else is taking care of this. Um, so that that was my biggest reasoning behind that. Um, and the other reason also is because uh, um, it's very easy to join company that do cool, sexy stuff. But healthcare is not cool. It's not sexy. Um, it's, it's rewarding. It's rewarding. That's exactly it. Right, your end user is a human life. How many people can claim from other industries saying, "Hey, what do you do?" Well, you know, I trade, uh, I short stocks, or I trade. I'm in the bond market, or I essentially work for blockchain for managing security and fintech. Great. What do you do? Uh, I'm trying to help cure patients and cure cancer. Um, I mean, that's a party line. <laughs> you got to agree with that. I agree. Um, Every time I get in an Uber, like on any business trip, and they usually ask you this question, right? Like, yeah. what do you do? So I, I have a, I, I'm co-founder of a company. It's like, what do you guys do? Uh, we're working in AI and cancer. And they don't even know what we're doing. The guy goes, wow, AI and cancer, that's so cool. Yeah. Good for you, right? Like they really get excited and you feel like people yeah. actually are cheering <clears throat> for you. It is, it is. And, I, I, and, and, and here's the other reason, right? Healthcare, not just in the U.S., but everywhere globally, is, a, is going to be one of the biggest issues and problems from an access and affordability if it's not curbed, if it's not managed. This is the same issue 
uh, for affordability in India. It's the same issue in Africa. Uh, it's the same issue in China, um, et cetera. So this is not a U.S. issue. This is a global issue. So everything that you guys are working on at Mendel and everything all the companies in a 10-mile radius uh, sitting here uh, are working on um, applies to humanity, applies to 10, 20, uh, you know, 15 billion people eventually 10, 20, 100 years out. And we need to get this right, right? Um, we can't just, there is no, you know, I mean, I don't want to quote Yoda here, you know, uh, do or do not, there is no, uh, I, I forget what the exact quote is, right? Um, but uh, I don't think we have time to try anymore. We just need to execute. We need to get this right. Uh, it's very important for our future, for our generation's future. This is for your kids. I mean, if you think about it, saying, what is the legacy you want to leave, leave behind for your kids? What is the grandfather story you want to tell your grandkids 50 years from now, right? That you were the cowboy for healthcare, that you really tried to fix this, right? And, and that's the motivation behind it, saying that we, we should be known as the cowboys of healthcare at the end of the day. Jenny, um, I'm really thankful for you coming all the way from Boston to here. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you had fun at Mendel. Always. I would have to say I always enjoy our conversations. Uh, as I said, it's usually there's a lot of good ideas. The oath idea is a great one. I think I'm gonna get everyone here in, in the company to start taking an oath before they joining because you're absolutely right. People have to understand the responsibility with um, that comes with that. Uh, but again, thank you so much, and um, yeah. I uh, hope we see you soon. Yeah.